Hey everybody, Talk here, and uh, this is part two of our How Good Were Dragons video, and this one's going to cover Beast Dragons. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, some of my subscribers who pointed out in my last video, because I asked, uh, if there were any examples of really big, like this, um, Beast Dragons. And they pointed out the Alphas from, uh, and the Mother Dragon, from How to Train Your Dragon. They're freaking gigantic. And they are definitely beasts, like just about every other dragon in that entire movie series. Thank you for that. Um, now, quick recap of what a beast dragon is. A beast dragon is a dragon uh, with animalistic intelligence. Possibly capping out at around high dog. High dog, maybe low ape, somewhere in there. That is what I refer to as a beast dragon. So that's wyverns, knucker dragons... Drakes, though technically drakes aren't dragons, but I'm going to lump them in there anyway because they're close enough at this point. Things of that nature. Now, something that needs to be discussed. How domesticatable are dragons? That's the great question here. Um, we should look at the actual animal kingdom for this. We don't domesticate things that are on the top of the food chain. And let's be realistic here. If animalistic dragons existed, you know, um, wyverns, drakes, those sorts of things, they'd be the top of the food chain. Probably. Um, unless co uh, common dragons, like D&D style dragons, existed, then they'd be below that. But they'd still be very high up on the food chain. They would be at least on par with things like, um, in our world, crocodiles or sharks or particularly large cats, things of that name, things like that. So you wouldn't think immediately that that would be a particularly easy thing to domesticate. However, there are examples of large cats being domesticatable. Cheetahs, for instance. Apparently cheetahs take quite well to domestication, except for one big flaw. They do not breed in captivity at all. For whatever reason, they just don't. Uh, apparently it just doesn't trigger the natural uh, responses to induce breeding in them. So we have an example of cheetahs are a large predator that's fairly high up on the food chain being tamed. The general rule is that they're not. But let's say, for example, that that's how that works. Um, they work similar to cheetahs. They don't breed well in captivity. Or perhaps humans domesticated them a long time ago similar to wolves. What would having dragons do to warfare? Frankly, a lot. Um, now, as people will probably point out, we've had animals in war before, besides just horses. Uh, and horses, it's war, horses, war elephants. Um, you get the occasional war dogs. Those seem to be more of a skirmishing thing or used in the uh, far past. They don't seem to be hyper common, or even if they are used, not in particularly large scale. However, that's a dog. That's, we're talking at best, you know, three feet at the shoulder, give or take. It's a little different when we're talking about something that is effectively a armor-plated carnivorous rhino. That'd be a drake. They don't fly, but they're heavily muscled, covered in scales, um, predatory, possibly has a built-in flamethrower. <laughs> That's terrifying. Even if you can't ride it, even if that thing does not have the skeletal structure or musculature to allow riding, if you can tame that creature and just send it into the enemy, it will devastate them. It will be terrifying. It will demolish uh, formations of troops, because that's how the medieval era fights. You fight in cohesive bricks of men. That's how you have to move around. And this is a creature that would destroy those, because we're talking about something that has particularly large, thick scales. I mean, let's, let's take a look at the minute here. I'll, I'll get him a little closer so we can get a good look. Look at his neck. Look at these overlapping scales on his neck. Look at him on his head. He has... This is how dragons are almost always shown. They have large, um, very thick uh, overlapping scales that protect them, similar to a, a snake in that regard. They are effectively a giant-sized snake with legs, which is horrifying. 
The snake scales are quite protective, actually, because it's armor. Think about it. We have scale mail. There is scale armor, where you have overlapping plates of metal, and it's to redirect blows away from you. They have that naturally. Now, a creature of that size should have fairly thick scales. I'm not quite sure if it would necessarily go up like that or not, but I would assume so because they're fighting particularly large prey items in order to eat. So they'd have to be fairly well protected against large, strong opponents in order to not be harmed when they're preying on their meal. So this would be things like drakes or the wyverns eating things I would assume such as hippos, elk, uh, large, strong animals. Now, would this turn away a precise spear thrust? I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I would say so. Typically speaking, in mythology, their scales are about on par with armor, which is terrifying. So you don't even need to put armor on but you can still put armor on them. There's nothing stopping you from putting barding on your drake. Now note, I'm only talking about drakes. I haven't even talk, I'm not even talking about flying dragons yet. I'm talking about a terrestrial creature here. Now let's talk about the wyverns, or just unintelligent dragons. So we're talking about a dragon about the size of a horse, probably bigger than a horse, and can fly. What does that do to medieval warfare? Well, scouting just got a hell of a lot more accurate. I mean, think about what happened in World War I once planes became a thing. Scouting became fundamentally more accurate because you could fly over, you could see exactly how everything was laid out, you could draw pictures of it, that's why we eventually got cameras, because then they're perfectly accurate. They could draw basic pictures, and they could fly back and tell them exactly what they just saw. More so than someone riding up over a hill and having to look, and possibly missing half an army hiding behind the hill. That's, that's devastating. You don't even have to use them actually in direct combat. Just a scouting role alone changes things. Because now everyone is working off of significantly more accurate information. And then, of course, someone's just going to get the bright idea of, hey, why don't we just give Jim over there and his wyvern a bag full of tent stakes, and he can just, you know, pull out a couple of them and start dropping them over the enemy, and then, you know, occasionally hit a person. It doesn't even matter if he hits anybody with it, really. He needs to hit, like, one guy. So he just takes the bag, dumps it over the side, and he kills one person, and now everyone's terrified, because now you could just die at any time. Because that was something you didn't have in medieval warfare. You couldn't just die at any time. The battle was going to place, take place over there. Well, you marched over there, and then you fought there, and that was it. It was it was a little more structured. It was a little less random. But now if some passing scout could just drop a rock off the side of his wyvern and kill you, well, now you're going to start getting PTSD. Not to say that ancient soldiers didn't get PTSD, but it was different. It wasn't quite the same as, you know, you get into World War I, World War II, things like that, where death is poking its head around every corner, every rock. The battles were a little more formalized. I don't quite want to say that because that's not, in, don't want to take it too far, but it's, that's generally how it works. Well, now you're going to get men with PTSD because they could just get bombed effectively. And I haven't even talked about putting someone on one of these things yet. They'd make devastating cavalry. They're strong as hell. They're far more aggressive than horses. So you now have a creature that has natural weapons designed to kill with an armored knight on top of it. Frankly, the, the, does the knight need weapons at this point? Well, let's go back to my um, armor-plated rhino, basically. The carnivorous rhino drake. The carnivorous rhino drake. That's... There. Someone used that in D&D. So the carnivorous rhino that you're basically riding around on that likes you, I'm assuming, because it hasn't eaten you yet, do you need a weapon? I mean, at that point, I just get a bow and shoot people every now and then. I'll just let that thing do all my killing for me. Because what's armor going to do against this thing? We're talking a creature that's probably two tons of muscle and armor plating and bad temper. It's going to run on up, smash through the enemy lines, and just start eating people. Now, think of something the size of a rhino. Rhino-sized head but probably slightly larger jaw to accommodate its teeth. What do you think, what kind of pressure do you think that jaw is going to exert? I would imagine a fair bit. Your armor's not going to save you from that, because that's not straight piercing. Yeah, there's piercing, but it's a lot of crushing force. 
you're going to get crushed like a tin can. And even if your armor holds, there's a lot of pressure being pushed on you. You're going to have bones snap, organs rupture. It's going to be unpleasant. Not even counting the fact that they could bite you and then just shake you like a terrier with a freaking chew toy. Have you ever watched a dog do that? They shake it crazily. That is because, and you'll notice this is on small dogs, small dogs hunted rats. What they did is they did that to snap their neck. Okay, so now we've got something the size of a rhino that's carnivorous and is shaking you like a terrier. You're dead. Your, your spine will snap, your neck will snap, you'll be dead. And then they'll just throw you off and go on to the next target. And this is only talking about their teeth. I don't know how these things are structured. If they are the giant rhino-sized style ones, you know, possibly with a large horn, no elemental breath, and they just nom on people, that's bad enough. Well, let's have one that's a little more designed um, like a big cat. You know, they sort of pounce on things. You know, so think of the the Neku from Star Wars, or, uh, hmm, here's a good one, from Avatar, the giant mole thing that that bounty hunter rode, I can't remember what it's called, you know what I mean, the giant shrew mole thingy she rode around on? Something that looked like that, but like a dragon. And we've seen things like this. I mean, drakes are pretty varied in what they look like. Something like that, it's sleek, it's fast, it pounces on things and claws at them, that would be terrifying. But now let's apply an elemental breath weapon to this. It breathes a cloud of poison. I wouldn't want to be riding on a thing that breathes a cloud of poison. It breathes fire. It shoots lightning. It breathes acid. It uh, breathes a blast of freezing air. Well, now you're riding around on what is effectively a medieval tank. You don't need a weapon at that point. Your weapon is the mount you're riding on. Uh, in D&D, this is referred to as a super mount build. You make a character who is desperately clinging on to the horrific beast that you have created with your class features. That's what this would turn into. Because what do you need a weapon for? I'm riding around on an armor-plated reptomammal. Because I don't actually think dragons are cold-blooded. I They might be. I've never seen anyone really talk about it. But you're riding around on this giant reptilian-esque creature that has a built-in flamethrower. What the hell do I need a weapon for? I'll have a sword with me in case someone gets close to me that I hack, have to hack away. But otherwise, I'm just gonna let Jumbo, the, the fire drake, burn all of my enemies for me. This is doubly so with wyverns. You get a, let's say we get a, a, a wyvern-esque dragon, or just a dumb dragon, it doesn't even matter if it's gotta be a wyvern. It breathes fire. Just, it breathes an element, and it can fly. Now you do bombing runs. Now that, there's an issue with that where you have to fly low, but you do it at night. If you're a dark-colored dragon that flies, well, you just fly at night, fly right over and just burn the camp. You know, 30, 40 feet up, just... And then just dive out of there, run. You only need to do it once. That's a terror tactic. In the middle of a prolonged combat, you can come barreling in from a flank, roast the flank, and fly away. There's no reason to stay. You don't have to. You can just keep moving. And in... From a general's perspective, even if someone shoots down a wyvern, it's going to crash. Let's say it's going like this. You turn and you shoot it. Momentum is going to carry it into your lines, and it's going to smash into you. So yeah, he lost a rider and a wyvern, but it's entirely possible it took out half a dozen men by crashing. Not to mention the other ones that made it through and been incinerated their way through. And on top of this, you have to shoot that. That's hard. Get, get a bow and try to shoot a moving target. Something that's going at least as fast as a horse can gallop. I think that's about 20 miles an hour. I'm going off memory on there. So it can fly, let's say, 20 miles an hour. Try to hit that with a bow. That That's hard. Doable, but that's why you'd have a cloud of arrows. But it, it's not easy, and you have to get a good hit in. You have to get a hit where they don't have their scales protecting them. Because I'm not sure if you'd be able to put armor on a flying dragon. I think that would screw up their ability to fly properly. But this depends, of course, on how they fly. If they fly with magical assistance, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, beast dragons are are terrifying from a mon from a very mundane perspective too. It's not like they have um, crazy supernatural powers. They have very simple, basic powers. I mean, you know, maybe they heal a bit faster. They're preternaturally durable, and they can have an elemental breath weapon. And then some of them can fly. This isn't even getting into the crazy stuff. They're, they're not calling forth storms. They're not 
seeing the future or anything absolutely crazy like some dragons can. They're just a big angry animal with some slight control over an element. I'd be terrified. I honestly give dra for grades now. Let's do grades. Beast dragons as a supplemental force. They get an A. Okay, I mean, there's there's bound to be issues with uh, taming predatory animals. I mean, you got to feed them meat and whatnot, so that's a bit of an issue. But frankly, that's the only reason they're not an A plus because you just got to carry a bunch of bunch of extra meat because now you're dealing with very large scale animals. And, and that's really the only downside I see to them, other than the fact that maybe they have shitty temperament. <laughs> Pardon my French, but that's... They got a lousy temperament. It, it, it would make sense. Every story I've ever read where they have bestial dragons, they're always cranky and kind of aggressive, which makes sense for a predator. So yeah, that's, that's beast dragons. Strong, vicious, and devastating on the charge. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Remember to like, share, subscribe, leave some comments below, and I will see you all next time.